So we're going to continue our series on the Sermon on the Mount. This is going to be part four. And we're going to be looking at prayer. Jesus gave a sermon, right? Sermon on the Mount regarding prayer and fasting. Part of it was meant for us. Meant for us in the Bible to read, to worship, to study, to appreciate now, prayer is the most talked about and referenced Christian practice, right? I'm going to pray for you. Oh, we need prayer. Nothing wrong with that. It's good that we have prayer. It is also the most underutilized and misinterpreted practice, quite honestly. And for many, it's the last resort. What are we going to do now? I guess we're going to have to pray. It's the last thing. Also... We're going to be looking at fasting today, right? And you may be saying, what? what? What do you mean fasting? Faster? That's old news. That's Old Testament stuff. We don't do that anymore. Well, fasting is not only mentioned here in the Sermon on the Mount, but it's also mentioned in Acts and other New Testament books. And we'll take a look at that and how it affects our modern day. But first, we're going to read through Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 18. That's Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 18. So hear now the word of the Lord. Jesus said, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street, on the street corners, to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their full reward. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't, if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men that they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received a reward in full, but when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So say it the word of the Lord. Amen. So did you know there's different types of prayer, right? Different types of prayer. <coughs> and really what Jesus hits right here is the individual prayer. It's so important. It's so important that the, that the disciples ask Jesus, well, how should we pray? How should we pray, Lord? And Jesus goes right into it. When, where, and how? And... and as a pastor, I suggest you do this during your devotional time. You may say, well, no, I don't do devotionals, pastor. Well, I suggest you start. Definitely do them. Reminds me of uh, when I was a NASCAR fan back in the day. And Dale Jarrett received his, his championship award. He talked about prayer. He said, if you're not asking... 
and you're not getting. If you're not asking, you're not getting. And I've been asked also, well, you know, do I have to just go into my room and close my door? No. No, not at all. You can pray anywhere at any time. And what we read here, the Lord's Prayer, actually unites Christians worldwide. You can go into just about any Christian church and know that the Lord's Prayer is going to be recited. We talked about that Wednesday night in the prayer chair. We talked about how the doxology came about, some of the history behind the Lord's Prayer. You can check that out on YouTube or on Facebook. And prayer is God's design, right? Prayer is God's creation. Sometimes we, we overlook this fact. It is by His design and His creation that we pray. It's His chosen line of communication. To put it in modern times, God has His own ringtone, okay? His own ringtone. And now you may say, well, here's the thing, Pastor. God doesn't answer my prayers. Just, sometimes He just doesn't answer my prayers. Well, then you're in very good company, quite honestly. Quite honestly, you're in good company. The Apostle Paul um, complained about a thorn in the flesh and prayed that God would relieve him. And God's response is, my grace is sufficient. Through your weakness, you'll find God's strength. Join the martyrs throughout history. In Revelation 12, 11, it says, For they love not their lives even unto death. And of course, Jesus Christ, Easter's coming up soon. And Jesus Christ prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Luke twenty two forty two. God's love is a mystery, and he has a master plan, and he has told us, I will never fail you or forsake you. Prayer takes patience. Remember Daniel's prayer in Daniel 10, 13. It took three weeks to get to God. We were told that the messenger of the angel was withheld by demons and Satan himself until the angel Michael could get through and help him. Ephesians 6 12, right? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Satan's demons do not back off their attacks. The closer you get to Christ, the more attacked you will be. However, they flee. They flee when you bring out the sword, the sword of the Spirit, and the absolute truth of God. Which brings me to doctrinal prayer. See, in verse 8, verse 8. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Well, then you may say, well, for that verse, why do I need to pray at all? If God needs, if God already knows my needs, why should I pray? Has it occurred to you that God loves hearing us pray His words of truth back to Him? He loves the word of prayer. It's the Lord's Prayer. He likes to hear it back. Said back to Him. Kind of reminds me when I, you know, was a young parent and my boys were young. And you would say, you know, say dad. Or say mom. And they would say it. And you lift up your spirits, right? God's a same way. God's our father. He likes to hear it. That's doctrinal prayer. Not just the Lord's prayer, but other verses. One of the reasons why we gather in corporate worship. And even when our prayers are not answered, God likes to hear us say, the Lord's Prayer and other prayers and, and, and 
purses. And yes, pray for your needs. Because that brings me to intercessional prayer. And intercessional prayer is often overlooked, it's underutilized, and some Christians won't even do it. To intercede means to go between, right? Go between God. When applied to prayer, it describes the act of going to God and pleading on behalf of another person. Examples in the Bible of Moses. Moses interceded with the Lord. Changed his mind not to destroy the Hebrew sinners. We see this in Exodus and Numbers. It's when an intermediary prays with God by taking hold of God's will. God's will. And refusing to let go until his will comes to pass. Well, that seems somewhat confusing now, isn't it? What are we talking about? Give you a give you an example. Two personal friends were pastors. Every day I spend time, or have spent time, currently spending time, praying that the Holy Spirit intercedes, intercedes in the minds, congregations, elders, decision makers, to lead them to their flocks. To find, to find their pastors, these two particular pastors. And we just prayed here, just before we turned on the camera, and we prayed for our churches and our pastors in our community, for the Holy Spirit to intercede. So you have someone in your life that needs to intercede. Need you to be the intermediary to intercede in their lives with prayer to help them along. Pray for the Holy Spirit to intercede in their lives. It will make a difference. It's the Holy Spirit that speaks to our hearts. It's the Holy Spirit through God that changes minds, that changes lives. Jesus lived an intercessional life. I pray for them. We see this in, in John. In John 17, what did he do with the cross? What did he do with the cross? Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Those are examples of intercession and prayer. And he still intercedes for us today. Amen. Now, verse, verses 14 and 15, I think these verses may be the most overlooked verses in the Bible. They follow the Lord's prayer, so they're, they're kind of overshadowed. It's the next thing that comes. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Ouch. 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 In my Bible, it's, it's, it's red and white. No, it's the black and white, right? It's there in print. It's plain to see. It's a hard thing, forgiveness, man. I tell you what. It's tough stuff. Forgiveness is a process, though. It could be a long process. Nevertheless, we're told right here, we're told here in verses 14 and 15 to forgive. And that's not an easy thing to do. It doesn't say forget. Okay? That's one of the fallacies we hear. Forgive and forget. It's almost impossible to forgive when you're a human being. I'm not talking about the little stuff done to you. Okay? I'm talking about the bad, the really bad, egregious sins that are done. And I don't preach to keep grudges. But I think we need to realize as Christians, forgiveness can be a long process, and it's a process. And it just doesn't happen overnight. Fasting. Jesus gets into the rules around fasting, what to do. You know, and it's not promoted in our culture. 
in many denominations uh, or in faith life in general, you never hear about it, right? We're really promoted to pray, but we're not always promoted to fast. And I think this is where the Jews have it over us, because they make it a practice in some of their high holy days. But I think part of it, because it flies in the face of our, our culture, society of immediate gratification. Well, if I fast, well, then I immediately should get this blessing. Mm -hmm. It does work that way. And also our culture is not used to going without. What do you mean going without? We can get anything just, just felt like that. You know, and, and, and somebody may be thinking, oh, well, Lent, this is the season of Lent. Lent is somewhat of a fasting practice. And I guess it's arguable, but it's being a form of sacrifice or self-denial, okay? But fasting appropriately includes prayer. It's often done in times of spiritual confusion, uh, spiritual need, a spiritual quest, um, repentance, heavy worship, and seeking of guidance. God's strength is perfected in our weakness. So, let me put the record straight here. Um, don't go starving yourself and say that Pastor Andrew told me not to eat, to starve myself, and to go on a hunger strike. No, it's my disclaimer, okay? Let's not get crazy here. As part of our physical being of uh, doing a physical act to show God that he is the most important, that we're willing to go without. And those who fast also say it clarifies your mind. And Nehemiah did it during Jerusalem's ruin. Um, in Acts, we, we read about the early church fasting before they sent Barnabas and Paul out on their first missionary trip. It shows God you're serious. <clears throat> so, you see the theme today in our scripture reading, prayer and fasting. And it's, you know, these two things are to be done to bring attention to yourself and not to show others how pious you are. And you read verse 5. Give me a second here. There. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues, on the street, corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. You read verse 16. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men that they are fasting. I tell you, they have received a reward in full. Last week, we looked at giving to the needy. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. You see the theme here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's just repeated three times. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. You see this in verses 16 and 18. Next week, we're going to be looking at talking about treasures in heaven, storing up treasures in heaven. We're also going to be talking about anxiousness and worrying, some of y'all's favorite subjects. <laughs> so what happens? What happens if we give up on praying or even fasting? If we stop it all together? And some people have in their lives. Some people just don't bother to pray. They don't think it's worth it. When you stop praying, unbelief sets in. Unbelief sets in. The cynicism, the denial, the refusal of the Spirit, the refusal maybe even of God and how His hand plays in this world. You're never going to understand him if you don't read and pray. If you don't read about him and pray, pray to him. If 
You will never understand God. In 1 John 5.14, we wrote, If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. I say this be heard, as opposed to having no hope at all. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, you taught us, you're teaching us how to pray, how to fast during the holy season. Let us be reminded of the sacrifices that you made for us, dear Lord. The blood on the cross to offer us life everlasting, Lord. We give thanks for this. May we be more dutiful in our prayers and look to you to lead us. We look to you for the ultimate hope of the life everlasting, Lord. We give thanks. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.